from the late 2000s until today. Social media has been flooded with a number of stories related to the mysterious passings of many high-profile 20th and 21st century personalities and the connected success of others, with many linking all of these celebrities to powerful secret orders. These theories ran from the completely stupid and insane to the creepily plausible. Although today, the Hashashin are more commonly known as fictional computer game characters and members of the incredibly bad movie adaptation known as the Assassin's Creed, links have been confirmed to exist between the original order and the number of these secret organizations who are allegedly responsible for several high-profile tragedies. The rich ancient history of Syria has seen the creation of a variety of myths and lures, ranging from ancient Mesopotamian giants to encounters with anomalous beings on its war-torn streets in the 21st century. However, one of its most enduring mysteries concerns a topic we had looked before and have been requested to look at again, especially since we deleted the original episode. That topic is the creation of a secret occult order during the medieval period that has left a lasting impact on the modern world. We have seen it throughout history. The unexplained and mysterious passings of high-profile individuals, celebrities, athletes, businessmen, and politicians. While initially, some of these cases would be classified as self-inflicted or accidental, later evidence could suggest that something more sinister was at play and that their demises could be at the hands of paid assassins. The medieval and renaissance periods, from roughly the 6th century to the 17th century, saw the formation and development of one of the most terrifying secret societies the world would ever know. Beginning in the first millennium, under the Nezra Ismaili sect, considered by mainstream Islam as heretics, this sect that lived on the fringes of the faith for years, secretly preached their ideology through their missionaries known as Dais, slowly growing in strength and leading to the creation of what would eventually be known in the modern day as the Assassin's Creed. It was not until one such Dais, named Hassan ibn Saba, began to rise in power, that the Order of the Assassins, otherwise known as the Hashashin Order, came to prominence. As the first Grand Master of the Order, based in Iran's al Bors Mountains, and then shifting to Syria's Ansariya mountains. It is here when the now famous legacy of the Assassin's Creed and its still little spoken of supernatural legacy. Hassan studied theology in the Iranian city of Ray and at about the age of 17 adopted the Ismaili faith. He was an active believer and rose in the Ismaili organization. In 1076, he went to Egypt, probably for further religious training, for three years. When he returned to Iran, he traveled widely in an effort to further Ismaili interests. He made a number of converts and in 1090 was able to seize the great fortress of Alamut in Deylam, a province of the Turkish Persian Saljuk Empire. Under his rulership, he created an elite squad of men from his most devoted followers, the Fidayin, to become trained assassins who over the next 200 years were responsible for the deaths of several key historical figures in and around the time of the Crusades, targeting both Muslim and Christian figures alike, including the Fatimat minister al Afdal in 1122, Ibn al-Khashab of Aleppo 1124, 
Raymond II, the Count of Tripoli, in 1152, Conrad of Montferrat, the de facto King of Jerusalem, in 1192, and an attempt on Prince Edward, who was wounded by a poison dagger in 1271. The order was a deadly guild of warriors, who believed that their leaders had a supernatural birthright, with access to occult knowledge most Muslims would never be aware of. The word Fedayin roughly translates to those who risk their lives voluntarily, while the word Hashashin is believed to be where the word Assassin originates from. Some say the word Hashashin itself referred to the Hashish drug but this is not likely. Many scholars have argued that the attribution of the phrase Hashish Eaters was a myth created by the enemies of the Nezra Ismailis and was never even used by Muslim chroniclers or sources from that time. Some sources indicate that the link between the Hashashin and Hashish is due to the order using the substance to brainwash and control recruits. This story is partly based on the renowned explorer Marco Polo and his account of young men being drugged and waking up surrounded by women in a lush garden. Marco Polo is an important aspect of the lore surrounding the Hashashin as he inadvertently helped blur the line between fantasy and reality of who they were and how they operated. His works and the writings of explorers like him painted an abstract picture of a secret order who were not only skilled assassins, but also a cult of individuals who may or may not have possessed anomalous abilities, allowing them to target their victims, no matter where they were. Of course, these mysteries worked in the Hashashin's favor by spreading the fear of the unknown amongst their enemies. History says that by the 14th century, this order was no more. But could the history books be wrong? And did their survival continue for hundreds of years, even up until the present day? The first victim of Hassan's order was the high-ranking Persian minister, Abu Ali Hassan ibn Ali Tusi. But before we continue, there are a number of different Hassans appearing in this episode, so bear with us in trying to keep up with who is who. Anyway, on the morning of October 1092, Hassan ibn Sabba sent one of his men, disguised as a peaceful Sufi mystic, to infiltrate Ali Tusi's heavily guarded entourage. This strike left a psychological impact on the entire region, as Hassan Sabba had shown that he had the ability to infiltrate anywhere and take anyone out, regardless of their security. And it is with this first death that he became inspired to establish an elite secret cult of fighters born from the Nezra Ismaili tradition, who would carry out similar missions. Here, Hassan would establish a network of Fidayin, who would infiltrate the households of prominent enemy figures and assassinate them. And it was not before long the Hashashin order's reputation in the 11th century became well known and well feared. Although Hassan Sabba would die in 1124 after an illness, the organization's esoteric legacy would see a re-emergence in 1162 via Ali Hassan, otherwise known as Hassan II. Under him, a significant change in direction would occur that would give the Hashashin more power and influence in the world. According to Bernard Lewis, in his 1967 book, The Assassins. In the middle of Ramadan, in 1163, Hassan II gathered his followers and announced to jinn, men and angels, that the Mahdi, a powerful supernatural figure we believe will appear at the end of time, had somehow communicated to him that he and the Hashashin were no longer bounded by the rules of Islam and that they can indulge in any practice they wish, as long as it was not overtly religious. With this change in direction, Hassan II encouraged a form of occult esotericism 
amongst his followers called Batin, which is a type of Sufism that is in some ways very loosely comparable to Gnosticism. Ruling parts of Persia and Syria until 1166, his chief subordinate in Syria was Rashid ad din Sinan, a man that became known as the Old Man of the Mountain, an old title that was already being spread in the West by Marco Polo, known as the greatest of the assassin chiefs. Rashid ad din Sinan was initially dispatched to Syria by Hassan II to evangelize his alternative take on Islam and to continue the assassin's mission. He first made his headquarters at Al Kaf Castle and then the fortress of Masyaf, a key location in the assassin lore. And as Rashid grew in power, so did rumors of his anomalous supernatural attributes. Some sources state that Rashid was a noted expert in alchemy, a form of magic. And it is said that he had trained the Hashashin order in mastering various forms of occult knowledge, including astral projection and various psychic powers. There is even a folk legend that stated that he had the ability to manipulate events all over the world by supernatural means. According to Abu Firas, an Ismaili author of the 14th century, who collected a number of stories about him, when the old man first arrived in Syria in disguise, a companion of his noticed that during that time he had no reflection, like a vampire. Rashid told his companion not to say anything about this to anyone. Later on, his psychic abilities began to become well known to the Syrian Ismailis of that time. Abu Firas told anecdotal stories of Rashid's telepathic powers, including precognition, the ability to see future events, mind reading, and most famously, mind control. Numerous historical sources speak of times where he would use his ability to control the minds of his own followers as a means to terrorize visitors to his mountain castle. With this, it is said that he would whisper words that would automatically make his recruits jump to their doom. While these acts of pointless suicide can be chalked up to psychological manipulation, a more fantastical story can be found related to the legendary warrior Salahuddin. In 1176, Salahuddin destroyed many of the Nizra Ismaili's possessions before laying siege to the old man's mountain hideout. However, one night, soldiers of Salahuddin came across him and his personal guard wandering the mountains, but failed to successfully kill him, claiming that they were held back by an invisible force that surrounded the leader and his guard. Later, Salahuddin would begin suffering from terrifying nightmares night after night, until one morning he awoke to find freshly baked hotcakes, the type only the assassins are said to have made, and the poisoned dagger next to his bed. If any of this story is true, it likely demonstrated to Salahuddin that Rashid was now capable of not only entering his mind, but also his physical space, encouraging him to lift the siege. By granting this independence to the Hashashin principality, Saladin had inadvertently not only ensured the continued survival and growth and power of the order, but also deepened the mystical reputation surrounding them. The only man-made power left that seemed immune to the growing Hashashin and Nizra Ismaili influence was the burgeoning Mongol Empire. During the reign of the Mongol warlord Guyu Khan, the empire's plan for expansion across Western Asia required the removal of the Nizaris from Syria and Iran. This Mongol threat was taken so seriously by the Nizari Ismailis, they briefly returned to mainstream Islam in a roundabout way by joining with the Abbasid Caliphate. 
in order to appeal to the European monarchs of England and France for a Christian-Muslim alliance. This venture ultimately failed before it even started. The first Mongol attack on the Nizari Ismailis came in April 1253 and over the next two decades the Nizari Ismaili resistance was finally crushed. By the mid 13th century, official history says, the Hashashin order was wiped out by the Mongol Empire, likely dispersing the surviving members of the organization across Europe, the Middle East and nearby Africa and Asia. Yet while most historians say that this was when the Hashashin order finally ended, in reality it appears that this was just the beginning. 300 years after the last known descendant of the original Hashashin order was believed to have died, the 1800s saw a string of mysterious deaths occur. They arise to be connected to the Nizra Ismaili sect. The most high profile of these mysteries included the assassination of one of the Mumluk dynasty rulers, descendants, right at the beginning of the 19th century. A short while later, in 1818, the leader of the surviving Nizra Ismailis had been given the name of Aha Khan, meaning spiritual leader, by the Shah of Iran. But by the 1840s, the sect were implicated in a plot to assassinate the Shah. Fortunately, over the next 150 years, the Aga Khan name morphed into a powerful and friendly corporate entity that is now completely divorced and separate from its assassin's roots. Today, they are funding a variety of charitable initiatives, including helping the poor and the development of arts, education and entertainment, causes to even working with UNESCO in the preservation of global heritage sites. Ironically, and in a strange twist of fate, in the 21st century, the organization made a significant investment across various historical monuments, including the preservation of Salahuddin's castle in Syria, home to the once mortal enemy of the Nezra Ismailis and Old Man of the Mountain. While this is technically a wholesome and happy ending, Unfortunately, between the time of the fall of the original Hashashin and today, other esoteric organizations who were inspired by the order began to spring up during the Crusades, leading us to the question, could at least one of these alternative versions of the Hashashin order, totally separate and distant from the Nizra Ismailis, still be active? And if so, how dangerous are they? From the late 2000s until today, social media has been flooded with a number of stories related to the mysterious passings of many high-profile 20th and 21st century personalities and the connected success of others, with many linking all of these celebrities to powerful secret orders. These theories ran from the completely stupid and insane to the creepily plausible. Although today, the Hashashin are more commonly known as fictional computer game characters and members of the incredibly bad movie adaptation known as the Assassin's Creed, links have been confirmed to exist between the original order and the number of these secret organizations who are allegedly responsible for several high-profile tragedies. These theories have become so popular that they have even been incorporated into the lore of the video game series itself. But what truth is there to any of this? Many mainstream historians admit that by the early 16th century, a new order had been established in the Hashashin's wake. And this order contained the blueprint for many modern day mystical orders, who allegedly have a grave influence on the modern world. Beginning with the short-lived Roshinaya, otherwise known as the Illuminated Ones, in 16th century Afghanistan, this movement was founded by the Pashtun warrior and Sufi Bayazid Ansari. They had adopted much of the ideology and mysticism of the Hashashin, but this time governed by a philosophy of peace and egalitarian values. 
However, this more wholesome version of the creed would quickly be crushed by the growing stranglehold the Mongol Empire had on the region. Yet, by this time, the Roshinaya had already gained an ideological foothold in Europe, where seeds of a less than savory version of the order would begin to evolve. According to Robert Anton Wilson and Robert Shea, the beginning of the 17th century saw the foundation of the Illuminated Ones of Spain under the name Alumbratos. Here, instead of a practice of a mystical variation of Islam, the group were known for developing a mystical form of Christianity in Spain during the 15th and 16th centuries via the Knights Templar. In addition to Hassan ibn Sabah's use of alchemy, in earlier episodes we spoke about the importance of this type of quote-unquote magic and the rise of hermeticism. Here, we examine the theoretical threats linked to them, be they human, cosmic or paranormal, like the mind-altering anomaly nicknamed the Jerusalem Syndrome or the nuclear experiments with the supernatural alchemical mineral called red mercury. Links to these episodes can be found in the description box below. These threats are associated with these medieval orders that allegedly have a powerful influence till this day. Therefore, you would find that a common trope amongst them would be the use of alchemical iconography and its ancient Egyptian origins. The journalist Mehmet Hassan Balut wrote in 2021 that the Knights Templar were also Hermetics and because of them, throughout Europe, Hermetic symbology made its way into many of the major institutions of that time. He states that after the Muslims recaptured several countries across the Levant, Venice became the Templars' new headquarters. And from here, ancient Egyptian symbology began appearing across Europe. Understandably, the Catholic Church were not happy about this, and so began to push back hard against the movement. However, by this time, according to Balut, the Alumbrados had already succeeded in infiltrating the church and even in removing the Pope. From here, this group spread to France in the early 1600s under the name of Gurinets, even though they were subsequently suppressed by the authorities in 1635. They resurfaced again in the 1700s, first in France and then in Germany, under the name the Bavarian Illuminati. Even though this group only lasted to 1785, the alchemic symbology and the esoteric blueprints, first employed by Hassan Sabba and the Hashashin Order in the 11th century, and then modified by the Knights Templar with an added ancient Egyptian flavor, would remain evident till today in popular culture. Although we can safely assume with confidence that the Hashashin order themselves are not actively assassinating people in the 21st century, their esoteric symbology, as well as tactical military and espionage, influence remains ever present. As an extra caveat, Hassan ibn Sabba and by extension Rashid ad-Din Sinan used the form of psychological warfare to put fear into the minds of their enemies and potential enemies. While back then this fear was spread through word of mouth, today a variation of it is spread via media and social media, with the most paranoid amongst us highlighting odd alchemical and ancient Egyptian symbology, randomly appearing in everything from classical architecture to the latest hip-hop video. By remaining hidden in plain sight via symbology, the Hashashin order despite being crushed several times over, have achieved a form of near immortality, since many of their occult beliefs have more or less become engraved in the modern world. But what do you think? Are we wearing tinfoil hats here? Or could there even be more truth to the fiction? But we are only just scratching the surface. In a couple of upcoming episodes, part 2 and part 3 of this topic will be done in collaboration with the History Profiles YouTube channel, where we will look deeper into the Knights Templar. So be sure to have your notifications turned on for that. In the meantime, 
to learn more about the philosophies of some of the historical personalities mentioned in this episode, please come across to my personal channel, The Library of Wisdom, and also make sure you are still subscribed, like, comment, and if you want, share this video before we see you in the next one.